Hello there, my friends, and welcome back to TNO, which we're playing in episode 12B as RFK. So, last time we decided to continue playing on with RFK and have continued to push for more social democratic things with the center of the NPP party leading the way. But now we have the tortoise crosses the finishing line. By going slow and steady, we've had far less resistance setting up our new integration agency, and we're able to wrangle further funding for it in an omnibus spending bill in the Senate. Goldwater and his cronies aren't happy, but even they have to admit that integration is the way America's going, and if they can't stop it altogether, they need to, they seem to be satisfied by being as obstructionist as they can and making us integrate the nation as slowly as possible. Our new integration agency might be a little bit more toothless than we had originally wanted it to be, but something is better than nothing, and we just don't have to get the strength to take another beating from the segregationists and states' rights types at the moment. Maybe as the years go by, we can slowly give our agency more powers and increase funding to make it as strong as possible as it should be. But for now, at least we've won another small victory for integration, so we remove public education. But we do get subsidized higher education, academic base, poverty rate, and research facilities go up, which is great. And Broken Arrow, the Germans blink. Important news. So yesterday, at the end of last episode, we were having issues with the Germans. So, uh, but they, now they blink and they're like, you know, let's back off. Important news has just come from the standoff in the Norwegian Sea after unceremoniously dropping their salvaging prisoners back into the water. With no small amount of spite, the German flotilla has peacefully passed through our blockade one ship at a time, however. Hours ago, we were one angry shot away from the Third World War. Now our nuclear weapons and our air crew are out of German hands, and we've decided decisively won the standoff. The doomsday clock, it seems, has been moved an hour back. Thank God. Oof. And actually, let's come over here. Uh, we got to get more political power. Actually, we do have more political power. We're going to ease southern fears eventually. And look at that. American society is still disunited. Oh, well. They didn't love it. All we wanted was for people to ha spend their whole lives living in racially homogeneous communities to immediately get used to the idea of living next to people different from them. But for some reason, it hasn't been as harmonious as we'd hoped. Our first working class planned suburbs have been opened, and they're already filled with racial strife. Urban whites flocked to our new planned communities to get out of increasingly impoverished and crime ridden inner city neighborhoods, but quickly got angry at having to occasionally see black people doing such heinous things such as living their lives, <laughs> following the law and raising their children. Okay. Things recently came to a head in one of our new suburbs outside of Chicago. What do you expect? Where minor acts of vandalism against black families quickly escalated into a full blown riot led by local blue collar whites, many of them first or second generation immigrants who have, paid, who have had little prior contact with black people. Local police were able to put it down without any loss of life, but a handful of riders or the victims are in a hospital with serious injuries. It seemed that despite our best efforts to the Contrary, our new post-racial suburbs have become just another battlefield in the ongoing discord plaguing the nation. Why can't we be friends? God, that's a fun song. Oh, this happens in Indiana, Michigan, and I think it was Illinois, I think? Oh, let's see. <laughs> Campaign where we haven't. I wonder how, how much support we can get with NPP. But we gotta save our political power. I do want to do this one. Oh, what, we got another one here? Fight for the schools. I, I like fight for the schools, but the Emperor Strikes Back. We could hardly expect the Goldwater to stay quiet after we tricked him into voting for our new integration agency. And he's finally returned fire. Earlier today, Goldwater and his coterie has held a televised rally in Washington denouncing President Kennedy's efforts to further integrate America, calling him a despot and decrying the supposed tyranny of the federal government over the rights of the states. I apologize for talking very quickly. Unsurprisingly, he's particularly angry about our dirty tricks and repeatedly compared the President's actions to the past disgraces of Nixon and Harding. Goldwater's charisma has made him the media's darling, and his ranting is being carried on every major TV station. We've already been getting some very angry calls and letters, both from the members of the public pissed off about integration and our party faithful who are upset that we're allegedly tarnishing the cause by engaging in deceptive tactics. Goldwater's increasing influence is becoming worrying. We need to do something before it's too late, and he ends up as frontrunner in 68. Well, that's okay, because the next 68 will be 2068, which we might not even be alive, because it's already 69. Nice. He can bark, but can he bite? Perhaps he can. Let's see... I want to make sure that the party becomes more unified, and we've seen it less as a liberal candidate. Even though, like I said in the last episode, I really don't know if we can get assassinated. I don't want to tempt fate too much, because I think we're doing well, but we have a new consulate. We've been approaching the government of West Siberia once again, this time asking to establish a consulate in Washington. This would bring our countries even closer and would be a good way to improve relations between our two states. However, this may show we are taking sides in Russia, and if we want to keep our neutral stance or show more interest in another government, we may want to reject the consulate. Still, trade will be able to facilitate between our two nations even more than before, giving us access to larger amounts of oil and more influence in the region. Building a consulate will no doubt become very beneficial for us, still there will always be re repercussions for getting too nice with the West Siberians. Allow the West Siberians to establish a consulate. Cool. Very, very cool. So, let's see. W yeah, campaigning with Waltz is not bad, but that's 50 more political power. So, we'll be seeing a little more liberal judge. We got 150. So, for 250, we can improve our academic base, because currently it is... It's doing actually really well, 6.5 a month. Primary schooling, yeah, we can do a lot better than that. We're going to go campaign for schools, and then we're going to ease Southern Fears. Yeah. Because right now, the party's ready for anything combined, but American society's, of course, disunited. But, you know, things happen. 
6.5, that ain't bad, man. We're really trying to help out the schools. How much is it costing us? Do we have a deficit? No, we don't, which is great. I mean, obviously, the minus or the negative deficit is eventually going to probably increase to actual debt eventually. And it goes, Yemen, into the lights. Ooh, keeping up with the Thomases. Very nice. Also, there's a comment from yesterday saying that, or from the last episode, 11B, that you should just finish up and do Consult with King, and then those who know best. I will, probably, as long as we don't get assassinated. I'll do the best I can with that, so. But I do want to go bind up our wounds. A Ray of Hope with Daring to Dream. I want to get there first, and then maybe we'll do some of the stuff. You know what, no. no. We're going to do War on Poverty first, because I want to improve our poverty rate as much as possible. So, the War on Poverty. The President has returned from his tour across the nation. While it is good for our PR opportunity, he is disquieted by the sheer level of poverty he encountered in some of the most destitute parts of America. If that we can claim to be a superpower while our own citizens endure such grueling hardships is appalling. As long as there is plenty, poverty is evil. And the President will make absolutely sure that his office will dedicate itself to the eradication of poverty in our great country. Civil War ups in Yemen. Very cool. Very, very cool. We're still building some more civilian factories up and keeping up with the Thomases. Winding his way through the suburban expanse of Milwaukee, Leroy Thomas walked home from school past dozens of houses, each of the image of the other. The sun had just dipped below the horizon and the cicadas were out of the cool stillness of the twilight, serenading Leroy as he made his way again and again past the same house with the same lit window and the same TV screen. His family had only recently moved to the new suburb, a product of the president's plans to integrated tract housing at affordable prices. Most of their neighbors were white, but there were a few other black families here and there. Often he found it hard to believe if he lived in such proximity to white families. They always seemed courteous enough, but who could tell if the thorns of their hate twisted their hearts, hidden away from their neighbor's eyes? As Leroy reached, reached his new home, he smiled to hear his father's favorite jazz record playing, filling the air with mellow saxophone notes and clash of cymbals. Placing his books down, he joined his father and his sisters at the table. Leroy's mother led them in saying grace and then served them at all a plate of roast chicken with mashed potatoes as Leroy excitedly told him about his day and the wonderful things they had at his new school. Leroy's parents smiled at others or at each other as he talked. Maybe they really had a future here. It was about then that a brick crashed through their window. Hate is best hidden within a smile. Is that all you have? Mashed potatoes and roast chicken? What about the vegetables? Come on, you gotta get vegetables in there. Maybe a little bit of fruit, but vegetables, they're good for you. Come on. That's the biggest problem with that event. <laughs> Where are the vegetables? Cool. And we're going to continue fighting for schools. 6.5 becomes what? Oh, the Stonewall Bust. Just a routine raid we shall overcome. It starts with a sudden blackout. 205 patrons of the Stonewall stop and stare in the sudden dock. It's 1.20 a.m. outside, to be sure. And bartenders reach for the panic buttons as they try to calm their customers. The four undercover officers curse as they fiddle with the switches, and then the lights flicker back to life. The few who realize what is about to happen begin pushing their way through the crowd, but the moral squad have already locked down the window exits and are marching through the doors, flashlights in hand, as they bust the biggest gay establishment in New York. The raid doesn't meet with a receptive crowd, to say the least. As officers led those in women's clothing to the toilets, many resist. It's common knowledge that those who get arrested by the moral squad as cross-dressing men don't make it out without bruises, spit-drenched faces, manhandling, and such. Men with faces lean and caked up with makeup wrestle with their cuffs and spit on their captors. None of the bars patrons have made it this far in a world which mostly despises them without getting a little rough on the edges, and when the man pushes them around, they push right back. By the end of the raid, concludes about 150 people are under arrest. But more are gathered in the late night darkness of that big apple when a storm is brewing that cannot be contained. Just a routine raid. Carry on, carry on, we shall overcome. And Yemen has defeated Yemen. Good job, Yemen. We shall overcome. The greatest LGBT riot in the history of the U.S. begins with a logistics problem. The Morals Police has grabbed 28 cases of beer and 19 kegs of hard liquor, but with the patrol vans occupied elsewhere, they have nowhere else to put it. And said they keep the patrons on lockdown as the wagons arrive far too slowly for a police operation. The patrons, of course, are understandably upset, and those, not under, those few not under arrest quickly join the growing crowds gathered outside the building. Many of them know that once, in, once the end dies, so does the living, breathing heart of gay culture in the greatest city in the world. They have everything to lose. As mafia members and patrons are loaded into the wagons, many are still struggling. A lone voice breaks up. We shall overcome a protest song written for the South African War. Finds receptive ears in another angry crowd facing another unwinnable fight. Uh, growing crowds, cheering growls of gay power echo from the crowds, which have swelled to bursting in the streets. Storm at Delavari falls to the floor, struggling against four officers, and all hell breaks loose. Records are unclear what exactly happens next in a wave of anger. The mob pushes over police wagons, hurls bricks at the officers retreating into Stonewall. Presses garbage against the broken windows. Many of the most repressed members of the gay community lead the riot. The drag queens and the street boys leading a wild, wild charge. Silvio Rivera, a notable drag queen, will remember it as the greatest night of her life. The doors of the inn are broken open with a battering ram. Officers inside prepare for a fiery last stand, and then the police trucks arrive. Fire to the fuel. Oh boy. Pay off some debt. 
Kick lines and tear gas. The initial reaction is one of rage. Officers bloody and coated with garbage and in ruck with violence, and the fairies did it. The fairies. Violence explodes on the streets as police officers take the law into their own hands and hammer, ra hammer their rage under the de now defenseless. The mob arrayed against them is far too far and gone to care. They form the rough outline of a cabaret chorus and begin to sing. Their voices are piercing in the late night, and the police have had enough of being needled. They rush the line. Many women get hammered with nightsticks as bedlam spreads to the surrounding streets. Crowds run around the police officers, laughing gaily like warriors in the light of burning cars. By the time the riots come to a halt, Christopher street is blocked. Half the cars are on it are overturned, and every garbage can for a mile around has been emptied into the streets. Witnesses describe an odd beauty to the refuse strewn street like a river of broken toys. Of course, the streets aren't the only thing breaking the news. All through the next day, crowds gawk at the burnt-out show of stone wall, and when the next light comes, or next night comes, they, they are then joined by the songwriters, poets, activists, and tourists washing down the streets in a tide of exuberant energy. Allen Ginsberg notes on the way back that the guys, they were so beautiful, they lost, they've lost that wounded look that fags all had ten years ago. An incredible sight. And Oman is killing Oman. Insurrection in Oman. Oh, man. Uh, yes. I can't help... Oh, oh. Layla. Huh. Kabus bin Saeed al Saeed. Hello, Saeed, Saeed, Saeed. Galib al Hinai. Maybe these are oil pro salad volunteers. I had that. Reserve fleets, cool. How about we get some strike groups? I love strike groups, because eventually we're going to have a little episode probably with the Japanese, and that's not going to go very well for anyone. Let's see, 7.5 a month? Not bad. How's Canada doing, actually? Hopefully Canada is doing well. They're led by John Diefenbacher. He was born in eh, 95. Wow. He's a more senior man. He's, he's kind of old. Not going to lie. That's kind of old, don't you think? He's kind of old, man. Kind of old. That's okay, though. Minus 19 billion. Yeah, not bad. Are we still building up civilian factories? Yes, we are. That's good. Keep building up Angola. Ah, uh, and the war on poverty. How can America be called the greatest nation in the world when millions of our citizens drown in abject squalor? Across the nation, children starve, workers are paid a pittance, and whole communities slip through the cracks. It is imperative that we break the cycle of poverty and lift our poor and dispose dispossessed out of that dark abyss. It is our duty as rulers, as fellow Americans, to ensure that all our people can rise out of poverty and be provided with the opportunities they need to pursue happiness. On his journeys across America, President Kennedy has seen poverty as no other politician has. Children starving in Mississippi, farm workers treated like slaves in California, blacks across the South living in utter destitution, he saw it all, and behind the proud faces of the men, he saw the shame, desperation, and the resignation. He had the emptiness, he saw it, in the children's eyes, eyes from which the light had long so gutted out and the thought of his own children. Those images of pain and degradation remained with him, consuming his walk, waking thoughts, haunting his dreams. He knew he had to do something for whenever he closed his eyes, he saw those dark, shrunken faces crying out for their savior. But Rome was not built in a day. The president knew to his eternal consternation that poverty was, like everything else, twisted into a political issue by the cruel vipers of Washington. The aid of Wallace and his cronies could be vital to the success of his first, of his first salvo of anti-poverty legislation, but would their support be worth the price? What's one more favor among party brothers? Expenses will rise, get more unified, less liberal candidate, lose support, get political power. Greatly anger the more hawkish members of the MPP. We're better off keeping our hands clean. Expenses rise. Grizzled more divided. Hmm. Party brothers. Greatly anger. I don't want to piss off anyone, so we're going to have expenses rise a little bit. I don't mind if the party gets a little bit more disunited since we're already pretty united as it is. But we're going to do this one, Federal Food Banks. There's more than enough food in our country to feed the people, but there are many who simply cannot afford to feed themselves and their families. While these people struggle just to get enough to sustain themselves throughout the day, it is possible for them to... It is impossible for them to spend any time trying to improve themselves. We must establish food banks to provide for the most destitute among us so that they may have a chance of pulling themselves out of poverty. We can source donations of food from generous Americans and grant federal funding to buy out excess stock from stores and supply centers. Ultimately, we must ensure that no one goes to bed on an empty stomach. We get a little bit more expenses, but my goal is that even though expenses may rise... Getting poverty under control will be a great, great thing for us. Because right now, we have 25 to 50% poverty rate, which is not good. But if we can get to, what was it, 15 to 25%, that'll give us more taxable income. So basically, we get more money through raising people up from poverty. At least that's the hope. As we're, of course, still slashing the national debt. I could invest in the GDP, but nah. Debt, debt's not a good thing, so... Federal food banks. Oh, RFK, you're doing a great job, and we have 53% for social democracy. Considering reports. Oh, a lone wolf can be scared off easier than a whole pack. And here we go. So if this goes poorly, I'm just going to do fade and fade out, just because I don't want to go to war with Japan. And why would we want World War III? Why would we? That doesn't make any sense. Just in case, you guys are doing this. Do this, do this. There you go. There you go. Oh, more ships. Left cruisers destroys. Dots on the screen. Get me through to Washington. There's an entire Japanese fleet on its way. 
Oh boy. There we go. Good luck, guys. Good luck. More. You're gonna need this, son. Oh, blight deck. Uh, yes. Yes, definitely sword efficiency. I love that. Fighter director. Ooh, pass. Naval bombing, ground attack, fighter director. 20% sword efficiency for fighters is not bad. I like that a lot. I prefer that one over dive bombers, to be honest with you. But, an intact Japanese sub will be more than worth the scrutiny we'll face for accepting defectors. Or, we can't risk the so-called defectors launching an attack on the Western Seaboard. Advise the president to seek it. Cool. Well, that's going to escalate the situation. If it goes poorly, obviously it'll do fade in, fade out. But whatever. Because I, I, I just don't want to go to war. It doesn't make sense for us to go to war. Why would we want to do that? The White Horseman. The sub is in the waters. The Japanese could back off or face the price. Warn the Japanese that their business is to do nothing more than get their defectors back. It's in our waters. What do you expect? Seen as a less liberal candidate? Actually... We're working well together. We are not ready for anything. So we should probably work well together next. We have only 150 political power, though, so... And we can fight for schools again. Final command. There's nothing short of outright war. Let the world know that they struck us first. Our lives may be lost, but there's still be a, there's still be a war to remember us. So we'll probably end up going to war on fade in, fade out. In which we'll redo this again. That kind of sucks. I'm not backing off. No way, man. No, 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 no. World War Three. So I'll see you... If you want to read this, actually, first. That's fine with me. I'll see you in just a little bit. Alright, and we're back. So, at Death's Doorstep. I really wish that these had events right now, but obviously they don't. But we have Death's Doorstep. Perhaps this will be a lesson for both Americans and the Japanese to learn from. Hopefully that means that we've passed the crisis, so we don't get another event like that. But we got federal food banks. That sounds like a great thing for us. Let's see. The Affordable Housing Act. Not bad. Oh, try to pass a bill through Congress. Test the waters. Education. Richest men in Babylon. I would like to get down here. The Specter of Hunger. Just because our poverty societal development will begin to improve as well. Expenses go up, but so be it. We've seen as a more liberal candidate, so we got to keep that in mind. Let's go ahead and do build a safety social net. Let's see. The rights of the worker. Powerful handshake. Let's do testimonies from the people. Capitol Hill, by necessity, knows more about the true state of the Union than its own people. However, it is not omniscient. The knowledge within it bases its policies relies on a complicated hierarchy of departments, agencies, and offices. All of them are set with normal employees and managers, and humans can err and possess their own agendas, as Nixon attests. President Kennedy's ambitious road trip provides us with an opportunity to learn from more of the American people's plight than tabulation sheets process in D.C., thus giving our planners more information for the administration's reforms. Additionally, it allows us to offer them the government's or the, their government's tangible presence to reach out and assuage their worries of being left unheard yet again. Get more political power and more uh, social democracy. Cool. So just in case, for right now, we got 200 political power because we told the Japanese to buzz off and we'll be seen less as a liberal candidate. I'm not going to do anything else, just that one for now. We got some more research going. Ooh, it's 69. Let's grab some of this. Advanced anti-tank equipment. The death of Ho Chi Minh. A tragic day. Cool. Goodbye. Ho Chi Minh. 1.6 billion. Whatever. That's fine with me. And the Divine Mandate of Severe is killing these guys off, which is great, great, great. What is Bowman up to, right? Bowman, yes. They have a focus tree, and let's see. The Thousand Year Reich for Evermore. One of the following must be true. The militarist faction has been dismantled, as well as the reformists. Now, that is literally keeping them from doing whatever they want. So, that really sucks for them. The Heavy Hand. The Pragmatic Situation. Oh. The Walshaw Telegram, huh? Cool. But fortunately, we're going to keep spending more and more money with civilian spending. Actually, how much are we spending for construction? I don't think it's that much, but I can still slash it barely. Tokyo standoff. Has the Empire of Japan gone mad? Probably. Probably. Yeah, five, almost six billion versus almost six, six roughly 60 billion. Jesus, oh, that's a lot of money, man. I'd be content with just a billion, but that's just me. Keep building this up. Would be nice, very nice. Other expenditures, not really that much money. Which is a good thing. Hey, 472 factories. We must have just built some factories. Awesome. Palermo. Testimonies from the people. Oh, we're building up our little Madagascar and puppet. Love it. And next up, we shall do the poorest of the poor. In New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and a hundred other cities, faded posters of smiling families and sunny days bestrew the gr grim, grimy brick walls marking the seedier parts of town. Cloistered houses, arranged in haphazard patches, dwell under the shadows of its glamorous and ritzy skyscrapers, its inhabitants amiable from work to home and work, work again, thoughts filled with worries over rent and food and bills and, but nothing, and nothing but. 
They have no pride, no hope, no future beyond the 30 days they have left to pay for the right to live. These are the downtrodden of America, the countless tired and poor, who hang their heads low while its few to fortunate hold theirs high. This country cannot move forward as one without it slowly, however fortunate it is, then that their new government attends to them before all else. Very cool. Very, very good. We have 186 political power. So next up, we're going to fight for schools again, because I just want to make sure that our academic base keeps going up. But to do that, we'll get 150. As well, at the same time, we shall be doing... Uh, working with Wallace? Maybe not. Yeah, now the MPP is ready for anything, which is great. The Trench of Party Speech. Why is it that in America, stretching from Atlantic to the Pacific, with all the resources that owing, that owning most of the continent will provide, still have a class of people mired in absolute poverty? Why is it that in a nation that makes uh, that many more times more food than the richest farmlands on the planet still have people starving? Why is that in a country with the grandest skyscrapers and all the land to build and grow communities still have tens of thousands of homeless people? Why is it in a nation with the free best schools and hospitals that even our enemies' leaders send their children to study in or have their cancer is cured, have illiteracy at all, or have millions dying in pain and misery? The simple fact is that for far too long we've expected every American to lift themselves up, to climb up and out of the deep trench of poverty built by their own merit, strengths, and abilities to join the American dream that we all share, that system which we call a meritocracy and take such pride in. Has a great flaw, though. There's some people, though, who no matter how hard they work, how hard they struggle, how hard they search, or how much they save, how careful they are with their health, are struck by the misfortunes of fate and are cast out into that pit of despair, unable to scramble up. In the White House, I receive stories like these every day via letter and telegram as I visit every state and city and county. It is heartbreaking to want to help those that, go through little or no fault of their own, have been pushed into the trench of poverty. So instead, I say let's help those that need it. Everyone in the deep dark hole that they were dumped into. Those that were sick, we should heal. Those who have been maimed, we should lift up. Those who are homeless, we should shelter. Those that are scraping by, we should be giving a helping hand. This is the goal of social security, providing a baseline for support for those who need it, giving every American a chance to live the dream, to reach out a hand, to hand down a ladder, to pull everyone up from the trench of poverty, more security for the American family. Cool. Just give me more political power. 1.08, hey, not bad, not bad. Hubert Humphrey gave us some, the Civilian Budget Boots gave us 0.1, Federal Food Banks gave us 0 0.03, National Ethics Committee gives us 0 0.1, point, gives us point one. Open Unity, oh, and I don't want to forget, oh, goodness gracious. And when we get the 70s, we're going to have a slight crisis of oil. That is not going to be fun, especially with the debt getting closer and closer to zero, but it is what it is. I will cut spending, though, probably by that time, especially construction. I probably won't do any more civilian budget boosts, which will be okay, but I'll probably con cut construction spending just because we don't really need it anymore, but the 1969 World Series. The 1969 MLB season was drawing to a close as the dominant Baltimore Orioles, American League champions, squared off against the National League champions, the New York Mets. Both teams have had swept their opponents in their league championship games and were set to face off in this year's, in this year's World Series. The 1969 Baltimore Orioles squads have been considered one of the greatest baseball teams in MLB history, led by slugger Frank Robinson and pitcher Jim Palmer, as the team won 109 games and only lost 53, on the other hand. The Mets achieved the first ever winning season this year, led by coach Yogi Berra and pitcher Nolan Ryan. The mid-October matchup would go down as one of the most shocking upsets in the history of baseball. The talented Baltimore team routed the Mets 4-1 on October 11th. But the Mets stormed back and won the final four games of the championship, defeating the Orioles 5-3 tonight in the front of 57,000 fans. The team was quickly dubbed the Miracle Mets for the outstanding play against a formidable rival. It is the Mets' first World Series pennant, a series of for the history books. And people and things are falling apart. Now Iraq, please don't fall apart. We're currently led by Mr. Abd al Karim Qasim. At least that's how I think they pronounce his name. I have no idea. So many senators from our party. Love it. Oh, don't you love it when America is divided? We still need more ba main battle tanks, but that's going to happen every for the rest of this campaign, anyways. Let's see. Do we have any more shippies? We should probably train. Oh, yeah, four more. Nice. Not bad. Not bad. We'll throw you guys right here. Peace conference. Italy has defeated those guys. Okay. All right, whatever. Train guys. I'm gonna have you guys return home though. Thank you for doing your job. And go home. Cool. So what do we have here? Two, two, five. Ooh, what can we do? Ease southern fears, increase party unity. Anything interesting? Not really. The war on pacifism. We could do that maybe, but. The specter of hunger. What good does owning the richest farmland in the world do you if you cannot feed your people with it? Despite having more food than the world has people, Americans still shuffle along sidewalks clutching at their stomachs. Americans in our cities and towns still loiter around diners, malls, and restaurants, begging for scraps and leftovers and hoping for good Samaritans to come their way. This is a stark naked truth. America's bounties locked behind a rich man's window pane, and its penniless can only stare at the sustenance designed to them from the harsh outside. Progress for America means progress for all of its citizens, its most vulnerable, most of all. We must lift them up to a better lot in life by any means necessary before anything else we must approach them with our good intentions. If nothing else, they must know that no American will ever go hungry if President Kennedy gets his way. 
get even more poverty rate improvements, more political power, our expenses will rise a little, and they will lead to moderate increase in quality of life. Now we will be seen as a liberal, more liberal candidate, so when that finishes, we're going to immediately go ahead and ease southern fears, so that'll be good. The Citizens Basic Income Experiment. There wasn't a whole lot of fanfare when President Kennedy signed the executive order, and even less when the first 1,000 letters and the 200, ch 200 checks inside were sent out by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to families in 13 states and 68 communities across the nation. The instructions on the letter were simple. For the next year, you will be receiving the same amount of money every month. There was no cash, no requirements, no stipulations about how you could spend this money. Bills, clothes, housing, or just saving it was all fine. And best of all, it would be tax-free. The, the important thing was to keep track of what you did spend on it, and at the end of every month, they would receive a phone call and envelope with a short questionnaire to fill in to be mailed back. Soon the rumors began to spread that the government was just giving money to random people, which quickly began to work its way through the back through the political grapevine, and soon the Citizens' Basic Income Experiment was exposed via the Washington Post. The President has defended the program in a White House press conference, stating that the goal of the Citizens' Basic Income was to provide a baseline guaranteed income that would help the poorest Americans meet, meet, make meet, ends meet, and that it was just a year-long trial to see the results. The opposition has come from us in, from two sides, those in the Democrats and the far-right NPP who denounced government handouts to random people, which would be incredibly expensive, especially in the light of all the other social security programs Bobby's been pushing. But there's some in the CEMPP and the LNPPP who say that the RFK hasn't done or gone far enough. We should be paying even more money to more people for longer. Based on this backlash, the president has to respond, and quickly. Boost the payments to 250 and let the test continue. As we begin to rapidly improve, it'll be too expensive and disincentive by the work needed to cancel it. Let's do this one. But screw it, I want more poverty rate. Who cares about money? It is but a number. Mm, this is probably going to divide our party more because the far right obviously doesn't like that. The far left doesn't even exist, even though they technically work with us because they have no senators. I'm going to go ahead and do this one. Just ease Southern fears. Well, you know, I'm going to wait. I want to wait until we get an actual, like, event saying that we will be seen as a more liberal judge so then we'll counteract that immediately because i don't know what level we're at the game doesn't tell you what level of liberalness we're at but the death of joseph kennedy a spokesman for the kennedy family reports today that former president joseph p kennedy passed away in his massachusetts home in 81 he survived by his wife and six kids the older kennedy leaves behind a complicated legacy his success as patriarch of the kennedy dynasty was substantial as his sons john robert and Edward all made names for themselves in the political sphere the elder kennedy was elected president in 32 and presided over the slow recovery of the u.s from the great depression despite serious criticism for his non-interventionist policy both in economic and foreign policy he won a second term in 36. This second term was mainly defined, or mainly defined, Kennedy's continued reluctance to intervene in the European war and failure to fully prepare the U.S. for global power projection against the Japanese and Germany. Kennedy was a source of much criticism in the aftermath of his presidency, which only increased after the failed intervention in England and the signing of the Kagi Accords by successor Harry Truman. The Democrats would not hold the White House for another two decades, and when his son, JFK, succeeded the disgraced President Richard Nixon. Kennedy had spent the years after the presidency retired from public life, having lost his son Joe Jr. in a bombing raid over the Pacific, but he reemerged to help with his son's bid for the vice presidency. However, the elder Kennedy kept himself out of the public eye due to the widespread criticism of comments he made advocating detente with Germany to focus on confronting Japan and refusing to help with his son Robert's presidential run in 64. <clears throat> Regardless of how the American people remember him, Kennedy left a lasting mark on the nation's history and his family will most likely continue to have a major role in politics for the foreseeable future as the United States lives on. Uh, there's one other comment from yesterday saying that, you know, there's a lot of mention of JFK, you know, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, someone said, but like, yeah, yeah, I mean, we had him literally as president earlier in this campaign, and we did see, or, or at least I read that his head got literally blown off when he was assassinated, but yeah, there's a lot of references to JFK, so just saying. Mm. Drink lots of water. Love it. Oftentimes, when there's periods of silence when I'm recording here, I'm drinking water. Water is so good. I drink way too much water, I'll be honest. That's why I have to pee all the time. But, oh my goodness. Alright, we should get our focus on very, done very, very soon. Still, minus 20 billion. Not bad. Not bad. Boom. Do it again. 33? Eh, it's okay. Slowly going down. Okay, and are we seen as a more liberal judge? Hold on, hold on. Or candidate, I guess. The Spectre of Hunger, very nice. I rose by any other name. Now, we've done all of this. We can do the Affordable Housing Act, test the waters. Let's go back over here and do a racist prison system. One close look at the prison tallies and registers across the country reveal a stark pattern colored men predominantly from the ghettos and gutters of its sprawling cities filling more than its cells of than whites. Another look at the records loitering, petty thievery, minor brawls, sentenced by verdicts with half decades behind the dank and fetid walls of the Gray Bar Hotel. 
oftentimes more. By the time the black man leaves the rusted iron chains of prison, the court of public opinion will have judged him guilty again, and so will they remain paupers left with no choice but to break the law once more for their own sakes. Misjustice indeed, yet misjustice tolerated at best and at worst encouraged for decades whenever or wherever the heavy hand of laws reach. We must address this, and we get the clink event. Very good. I just want to pay off some debts, improve the dramatically improve the poverty rate. So right now, uh, those rights are outlawed. We get stability. Cool. Let's see. We get 7.5 a month. That's not enough. I must accelerate the decline of poverty. I would love to get to... I've never gotten a nation so far in any of these campaigns on my channel at the time of this recording to get the less than 5% poverty rate. That sounds amazing. But I'm not sure that's really possible. Expanded support ship roles? Nice. Military stuff? Did you just not see what I was doing? No, slash, 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 slash. What is Manchuko doing? Who are they led by? Zen Duo. I doubt they have a focus tree, substantial black market trading, trading light, arm trading is substantial. Alright, 300 political power. It sounds great. It's almost 1970. It's so close. So that means we gotta get some more research speed with integrated circuit computing. Thank you. And. And. Oh, advanced anti tank equipment. But happy new year, my friends. It's a new year, a new us, a new decade for American prosperity. Let's hope it goes well. Let's go back to industry and get some civilian construction four. Beautiful. All right, let's go ahead and do this. Improve anti tank. Thank you. Now, we're going to campaign for schools again. Just because we can. And ease Southern Fears. The underlying problem. Hearings unheard. Every missive somehow reported missing late posts past their schedule. Orders, words, and phrase changing as they climbed down every rung in the ladder of law enforcement. Letters swapped into wholly new messages by the time they reached a common patrolman. Work continues as we bring the rights of man to the rights deprived South, yet work continues as plottingly slow as it was since the days of Reconstruction. We must admit to ourselves, at this juncture, that work cannot continue unless we address the root from which their issues are birthed. If the Dixocrats aim to win this little war with a thousand bleeding pinpricks, then we shall have to grab them by the stem and root up them all the way to the god for a second tip. Ooh, tip. So the next action I will take, seeing as we did the underlying we're doing the underlying problem, the clink. We did the racist prison system, we did the specter of hunger, we'll be seen as a more liberal candidate, so the next move we make in terms of decisions is for us to reduce our liberalism. So the clink. The first and most glaring issue in America's blighted justice system is our prisons. To be incarcerated in America is to be thrust onto an abysmal pit of cruelty, depravity, and ironically hideous injustice. Our prisons are cages of torment and suffering when they should be a tool to reform and rehabilitate convicts, and like everything else, it's worse if you're black. Our prisons are torture chambers filled with people who have no right being there. This must change if we are to reform the nation's mechanisms of justice. We must bring justice to those without access to it and give those who are unjustly treated a second chance. But what we have here is a failure to communicate. So in about a month we'll have that underlying problem done. And slowly paying off national debt. Ooh, how much do we get every month? Actually, we still get one a month. That's not bad. You know what? I think we'll keep it there for now. I just want to make sure that we can pay off the debt a little bit faster. Because I don't want to have any debt because the way we're going... We're going to incur more debt, so if we can get less debt now, that'll be good for the long term. Hopefully. How's Iberian Union doing? They're still led by Mr. Franco, authoritarian democracy, freedom of investment. Hmm. Connection with the oath. And, oh, they're doing it over here. Oh, I remember this one. Keep things right on to the family. The dream realized. Best of both worlds, democracy with the flaws removed. A lenient hand of minorities, Order 44, the devil the show out rises from hell. Ooh, the best of both worlds. The way of the warrior is to be found in dying. It is down to this. Well, good job, Divine Mandate of Siberia. That's pretty good. What do we have here? Free civilian factories. Oh boy. Uh... You know what? I'm doing this in my Glen playthrough as well. I could build a lot of stuff here, I suppose, if we really wanted to. Some nuclear reactors. Might as well. Oh crap, someone fired a, just, just fired a gun. Oh boy. Oh boy. Hmm. Civilian factories. I mean, I don't want to build nothing but civilian factories, but we could do that. Why not? Anywhere else we need to build infrastructure? Hawaii's looking pretty good. Alaska? Oh, I forgot Alaska. I don't want to forget Alaska. Alaska's important. Guantanamo Bay over there, over there. Anywhere else around here? Angola's looking pretty nice. Madagascar, we're building up as well. Good. 
Senate one class election season begins. Oh, crud. Oh, man, who do we vote for? Well, who do you think we're going to vote for? I'm going to keep fighting for you and me, help me elect the MPP. Doesn't matter. If we lose some... We probably will lose some support, let's be real. But that's okay. Military construction four? Why not? And it's campaign season now. Let's see. We're doing pretty well overall. We need the East Coast. Ooh, let's do New England. Let's definitely do New England first. Nine hundred. So the next one we've got to do is East, more Southern fears. Actually, how's the academic base doing? Eight point five. That's really good. Poverty ten point five. God dang, that's beautiful. So I'm gonna stop touching this part of the focus tree. After we do as many Brown v. Board as it takes, because it's only weak, and you get more political power and stability. Brown v. Brown versus Board of Education was a landmark court case which marked the country's first ever step towards true equality for a century. By ruling that segregation in public schools is inherently void of constitutionality, the Supreme Court had shattered the old viney cobblestone walls which dot downs in cities nationwide, barring the black student from mingling with their white schoolmates. No matter how tenuous at the moment, colored children can now have better lives with which to lift themselves and their families and fathers' poverty thanks to this ruling. Our cause needs as many brown v. boards as it can afford, for that great case alone has advanced the Africans' lot by leaps and bounds. The President's advisors have concluded that we can afford the hit to the public opinion, a large share of it, doubtless from those who would see the administrations for forthcoming actions as tyrannical. Cool. So after that, then we'll go more on about other stuff. Who watches the Watchmen? President Kennedy lay in bed sharing or staring at the ceiling as his wife read beside him one of the vo vacuous Victorian romances that she loved so much. He was thinking about cages. It was Harry Truman, he recalled, who had once called the White House the finest prison in the world. He wasn't far off the truth there. All across America, right this second, millions of people were behind bars, some of them destined for the electric chair, and plenty of them should, should have never been there in the first place. Everyday prisoners were beaten, abused, and had their basic rights withheld from them, and this thought the prisoner is what we call justice. He had to do something. America's rotten justice system hung over his head like the sword of Damocles, swaying to and fro, and even he knew he wouldn't be free from its infernal presence until he scored the taint of justice from America. Tomorrow would begin working on a bill to reform America's prisons and end their cruel, discriminatory, and on unjust practices. Hang in there, fellas, he thought, he, as he drifted off to sleep. It won't be this way for much longer. I do. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and... Let's see. Campaign with Wallace. Less liberal candidate. Let's see. Campaign with Wallace will look a lot better in southern states. We might need that. But partisanship 101. President Kennedy tapped furiously at his typewriter, stopping only to sip the glass of scotch at his side, the ice having long ago melted. V Kennedy vigorously poured his thoughts onto the page in a stream of consciousness, knowing that the interns who wrote the speeches would be cleared up later. Or they would clear up the speech later. It was as fiery and as passionate as all of the speeches had been lately filled with rhetoric and calls to action. Kennedy was tired of having to kowtow to the writers in the party, but as he apologized to have a belt of scotch. He wondered if perhaps he could stand it, rein, in, rein it in a bit, throw the right-wingers a bone. They were party brothers after all, and he couldn't control Congress without them. Despite the progressive dominance, big names like Eastland, Thurman, and Wallace still drew voters to the party like Moth to a Flame or a Zapper. Browning Kennedy's debated with himself that it would be wise to make a speech reassuring the right-wingers. Obviously, he didn't give them any real concessions, but perhaps it was a good idea to change his language, scale back the bombast, assure them his plan for civil rights wouldn't be extreme as they feared. Slip sipping, Kennedy leaned back into his chair, furrowing his brows as his brain dragged him one way and his heart another. The heart wants what the heart wants. Bobby Justice was a little more unified. Let's not get too crazy, because we will get crazy, but not yet. So we're going to wait on this. There'll be no compromise. Stamp out the flames of hate. Let's keep away from that. Let's try to get elected here. Form the Jobs Corps. That might not be bad. The power of a, the power of a handshake, the bitterest of the bitter, uh, rose by other means. Build a safety net. Begin working on a new bill. We could probably get that passed, but what type of bill are we going to do? The rights of the worker? Implement public pensions? Lose support from unions and stuff? A federal minimum wage? Unions will like that. Campaign for support. Sit with Chavez. Reprimand the police. Will trust us less if we go through with this. The National Labor Relations. Fight for the future. Let's form the Job Corps. That sounds good. An age-old paradox. One needs expertise or experience to find work, but one also needs work to get experience. Our youth know this struggle best of all. Oh boy, don't I know that. As they are forced into dead-end jobs that provide no room for self-improvement, we shall establish an organization that will offer training and work experience for young adults across the country. Not only will this improve the career prospects of our young workforce, it will also fill the market with a wealthy, with a wealth of newly skilled laborers, which will provide a much-needed boost to local economies. Our expenses will rise a little bit, but... As long as we can lift those out of poverty, that's what matters the most right now. Sheathing the Sword of Damocles. The time has come to draft our prison reform bill to end the horrific injustice faced every day by America's convicts. Serving a sentence doesn't disqualify a man from having the same basic rights and protections guaranteed to every American. It's about time that moves from the realm of ideals into reality. We can't let inhuman 
penal colonies be run in America, but at the same time, changing such an entrenched institution overnight will be far from easy. Instead of going all in, we could instead issue some more moderate reforms to fix the major problems and try and deal with prisoners slow and steady. We could also preserve our political capital by issuing just token reforms that our proponents could hardly oppose without looking over dra draconian. Will that really do anything good? The fact is that injustice in America's prisons must be remedied. The only question that remains is how strong we should make the dose. All in. Toe the middle line. Don't rain on my parade. Water it down. Hmm. I think it'd be probably best to toe the middle line. Because I don't want to go too crazy. It is an election year, so let's go toe the middle line for now. Even though we have quite a bit of public support, we're going to toe the middle line. As much as we'd like to, it's still an election year, so... Got to keep that in mind. Upcoming okay, Senate race. we got 13 more days for the opposition's campaign. As long as we get a good amount of stuff here, I suppose. And let's go ahead and eat Southern Fears right now, just because... We don't want to be seen as too liberal. Don't rain on my parade. So once again, the abominable Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater has come along to try and ruin all of our hard work. Despite her prison reform bill having support from all the power blocks in Congress, including the Democrats, Goldwater has made a public show of his opposition to it. It seems like he'll protest any legislation we put forward no matter what it is. He's trotting out the usual arguments of states' rights, calling us undemocratic for imposing new law and order standards federally rather than leaving it up to the states. To an experience in politics, Goldwater is clearly trying to position himself as a tough law and order politician to the public and most likely a preamble to the presidential run in 68. Goldwater is president is there's a sobering thought. Thankfully for the time and being at least, he's powerless to prevent the cause of justice and our bill sailed through Congress making our prison reform law. Thousands of unjustly treated convicts will now experience a greater equality of life and have access to the same rights as every other American no thanks to Goldwater. Deal with a berry. Capital punishment, so we get more stability and free repair. Okay, cool. I, I, I know that you're technically supposed to go down this part of the, this uh, focus tree before the 68 elections, but it's already 1970, and technically, yeah, we do have elections, but it's not the presidential elections. It's just a little weird, you know, reading about the elections when they've already been gone, passed by. So fly over fury. Oh, crap. The Midwest is best described as a flat, empty land where people are born, born buried alive and spend their lives doing a little bit whiling their ways away as the corn grows and the rains of years erode the hills. Hey man, I live in the Midwest. Its people are almost fanatically proud of the wholesome Americana of their unchanging pastoral lives. They have souls of decay ready to be molded by the next charismatic stranger with a suitcase in hand of his smile, uh, with a with a suitcase in his hand and a smile on his face. It is their very plasticity that makes Mid Midwesterners politically dangerous. A crucial battleground in every election. The pendulum of the Midwest can make or break presidents and their allegiance aligning from candidate to candidate like the swinging of a metronome. Unfortunately, it appears as though the favors of the Midwest have swung through thoroughly in Goldwater's direction. Over the last few weeks, he's been touring in the Midwest, giving speeches at town halls against the president, a particular focus of being a recent prison reform bill, which Goldwater has presented to his malleable audiences as being weak on crime and perilous to the idyllic existence they hold dear. Goldwater's managed to stoke the reliably gullible Midwesterners into a fear. Protests have been held against the reforms in almost every major city in the region as Midwestern sentiment towards the president turns sour. We can only hope that the infamously changeable Midwest will swing back to our side soon or we may face ourselves in trouble come in 1968. Deal with it, Barry? I don't really care. It's 1970. Yeah, it's another election year, but eh, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever. Also, I sh it should be said that apparently at the time of this recording, you can't really trust these polls. You really can't trust them. We got a stellar campaign, but I don't put a lot of stock or faith in the, into this stuff, so we'll see what happens. And they run a masterful campaign. We got to hand it to them? Nah. Nah, we ain't. Let's see, what are we doing? Building more civilian factories. Great, great, great. Pay off some more debt. Less than $27 billion, but obviously this campaign, debt, I'm still going to pay off the debt. I'm going to talk about it a little bit, but that's not my main goal. My main goal is poverty and academic base. And I guess it, technically research facilities, too. So that's good. Foam the job, Cole. And actually, we want to make sure that we can still campaign. Even though it's not going to be great. Bal Thackeray wins the 67 Indian elections. God help us all. Well, maybe I'll look at him in a little bit. We need to do the Great Lakes and New England as well. So let's do Great Lakes first. The Republic of India. I think we did them earlier on, yeah. A conservative democracy here. Religious tension. The per Permit Raj. Disunited government. And you guys are... Ah, oh, there it is. Bath Thackeray. Form the Job Corps. Oh, and they are ultra-nationalists. Wait. 
Persecution of Abrahamic faiths. Oh, oh boy. Opening the door of opportunity. So many Americans spend their lives floundering in poverty, desperate to better the situation, but lacking the resources to make it happen. Too many. If we were to lift them out of poverty, we need to help them develop the skills and attributes to find gainful employment, training they otherwise would never have able to afford. The solution, the Jobs Corps, a new program run by the Department of Labor, aimed at providing low, young, low-income Americans with free vocational training to improve their quality of life by giving them the skills they need to better their own socioeconomic standing. With the advent of the Jobs Corps, we will be able to show America's in indigent Millions, a path out of the darkness of poverty where a brighter future awaits whoever is willing to make it theirs. We'll be seeing some more liberal candidate, and I'll be right back. All right, my friends, sorry about that, but like I said earlier, I had to go use the restroom, but let's go and do the Affordable Housing Act. To Americans, a house is not simply a refuge from the elements, a shelter providing warmth, or a store storehold for the prized possessions. A house is either their castle within the... They, they feel the most secure than anywhere else on earth. A house is their domain, its walls marking the bounds upon where their word is absolute law. A house is their symbol, and with it they declare to the world that they are free men, beholden to none but the government. Ship an American of his house and becomes little more than a slave. What does it say of America's, or today's America, then, that most of the citizens do not have the money to buy a house of their own? The party center has been long aware of this problem, and they have drafted a bill designed to encourage the construction of affordable housing projects in America's booming cities. Soon, every American will own a castle, but that is in their far, far future. We can instead content ourselves for having guaranteed the future as soon as President Kennedy signs it, signs it into law. We're going to try to pass a bill through Congress. Good luck. And next up, we would work with Republicans. Ooh. On passing this bill? From the far right. Uh, political landscape. We're ready for anything. Nothing there, really. So, uh, with the last thing that we just did before this one, form the job where we will be seen as a more liberal candidate. The polls are updated. Very cool. But we do want to make sure that we're not seen as too liberal of a candidate. So, even though we're not really up for elections, we're going to immediately go ahead and be seen. Uh, actually, I'm going to say political power because I want to do have the NPP look a lot better in southern states. So, we'll do that one, which will be good. And do we have... Oh, yeah, we do. Oh, crap. Never mind. Some room for compromise for the Republican senators. Okay, never mind. We have 49 plus 3 is 52. 57. 57 plus 8 is usually 65. So basically, all of our party supports our bill, the Affordable Housing Act. We can talk with the Republicans for 10 political power. All we get was maybe two more Republicans, which could further isolate people of other parties. Three of our party's far-right senators support our bill. There seems to be no room for further compromise. Okay. Whatever. A solid MPP campaign. Great. Good work, everyone. Great work. Then they, the opposition runs a respectable campaign. Good for them. Good for them. I'm not going to do this. Uh, if we have 49, like, all we need are, like, the Democrats. Or the far right. Or the Republicans. We don't need... We just need, like, two people. So, I think we're doing okay. And let's go ahead and campaign as Wallace so that the NPP looks better in the southern states. And we'll be seen as a less liberal candidate. And we get a more unified. Beautiful. Less than 25 billion in terms of debt. I love it. The president went down to Georgia. Smile plastered across his face. President Kennedy waved to the crowd. Joined on stage by George Wallace, his alleged party brother and perpetual thorn in his side, he managed to keep his smile from cracking as he shook hands with a bastard. God dang, his hands were clammy. Though the two men could hardly be more different, bonded together as they were by the Byzantine politics of the NPP, they were forced on occasion to put aside the personal hatred of one another to campaign together. As the South Golden Boy reaching a public detente with Wallace it would do a lot to increase Dixie's regard for his administration. Though we agreed on very little with the craggy old devil, they at least could agree on anti-poverty and anti-corruption policies. Appearing to have reached a public concord, they could present the appearance of a united front to the voters. Facing the TV cameras, the president turned on the charm and began to recite the speech that his and Wallace's writers had agreed upon the night before. Once they were done here in Atlanta, it was a whistle tour to Birmingham, Montgomery, Mobile, Jackson, Mobile, Mobile, and Baton Rouge to let all the South see the newly new unity between Wallace and the President. Of course, all the away from the cameras, the men would continue to absolutely detest one another, only speaking through their aides. Privately, Kennedy wondered if it was a good idea. Plenty of more of his more liberal supporters were utterly detested Wallace and resented the influence of his faction on the party, but without him, he had little hope of standing against the RDs. Well, sometimes you just got to make a deal with the devil, and hope they won't come back to bite you in the booty at the polling booth. Fatal contest, anyone? Cool. Uh, yeah. There's, hmm. Uh, I don't know much about Wallace. I have actually heard heard about him a little bit. He's very segregationist and stuff like that, but maybe someday I'll have a Wallace run. Actually, let's hope so. I, I want to do a lot of different runs here, so. Can we do anything about this? Yes, we can. Let's see. The Great Lakes. Eh, it's looking a little better in Wisconsin. Great Lakes. Ooh, New England's looking much better for us. New, so we need to do the East Coast or the Great Lakes. Let's go with the East Coast. Central East Coast, that is. Affordable. Great. So the Affordable Housing Act has passed. 
Duh. As the signing ceremony took place in the Oval Office of the Flash of Photographers, light bulbs, an assortment of real estate developers, civil rights leaders, and mayors from the cities big and small across America applauded as President Robert Kennedy signed the Affordable Housing Act into law. I'm a police I am pleased to sign this bill into law, which will make it easier to build affordable, livable, and safe housing for those Americans that could only dream before of home ownership. The president said moments before he signed the law, Today we say that every family in the U.S. has the right to own their own home. The new law will allow cities to rezone large swaths of area into high-density residential areas and encourage the development of new construction in areas where the cost of housing has priced many out of the market and provide low-interest loans to buyers to purchase them. The bill will also provides subsidies to develop common areas like parks and shopping centers and help establish manned transit routes for these new developments to the inner city. These new homes would not only be apartment blocks like some opponents had suggested, about duplexes, townhouses, row houses, and other such buildings that allow more people access to housing at the larger car-focused suburban dwellings that are too expensive or even forbidden for racial minorities to access. Government funding is only provided on the condition that no barriers will be put in place for African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanics, or anyone else. Already, there's many plans being drawn up for the Kennedy's Burgs in every city in the nation, redeveloping areas that have been overlooked and been abandoned for years, promising a new construction boom that will last a decade or more. A man's home is his castle, and there will be many more castles soon. The poverty rate gets even better, and our expenses will rise. So be it fight for the future. So since we did that, and we did campaign with Wallace, let's go and do There'll Be No Compromises, stamp out the hate of the flames. Let's do this one. There'll be no compromise. Clemency goes to watch word from certain members of the NPP these days. Savvy and careful at the same time, flawlessly shifting between assured President Kennedy that the most assuredly condone his actions and urging for a more moderate approach in handling the rot, more often than not within the same breath. They clad themselves in propriety and restraint of law and order and fairness, contrasting themselves from the swift and righteous justice which they only see as crude and un-American. So do they pair with old President Lincoln's words for all Americans to come together and bind the nation's wounds. Any doctor worth a degree will tell you that mending wounds without cleaning them, cleaning them will only invite disease and decay, bringing slow ruin to the body within. E Ever has the racism of the Southern Knots been the metastasizing root t tumors of dear Columbia's bosom? As well as good doctors should, therefore, it is our duty to excise them before stitching her sutures so that we may begin mending. But the task our moderates have shown to be the obstacles and impending, hindering good doctors' pace. President Kennedy believes in an ultimatum will suffice in either bringing these mutineers to heal or allowing them to exit their post with grace. No compromises here, no, no, no. Only minus 28 billion. And it is April 1970. And this is going to be a long video, but you know what? This is TNO. What do you expect? Cool. So how's the world doing? At least Iraq is not doing poorly for now. Still building ourselves up. We're done building. And Madagascar and Sudan is still on fire. Oh, this is where Anyaya is. I thought it was in Asia. Oh, hey, look. Ismail. Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Hello. Port Sudan, well, it's on fire. Very nice. We still get one political power a day. That's very nice. How's Turkey doing? The Turks are led by Al Parsian Turkis. And you guys are led by Scorza. I've heard Scorza is probably one of the worst timelines for Italy, but I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, towards a common currency. I still want to play as Italy, but I've heard that they're a little, like, bugged, maybe a little bit. So, keeping Italia strong. They look like a lot of fun. I'm just not sure if it's really worth playing as them yet, so. Wow, this is a big old... Uh, wow, even more? Holy crud. Oppose the class struggle. Assure the profiteers. Quiz contra nos. Wow, polls updated. Very cool. Wow, how much more do they have? Okay, they have a lot. The legacy of Kaiser. Oh, Caesar, not Kaiser. No, no, no. Not, not, not Kaiser. Expanded support ship roles. Cool. Debates in the I ISP. Holy cow, that is nice. Look at all those focuses. I love it. And we'll do fleet command and control. Plus 20%. Fleet coordination, just in case anyone wants to beat us up. And a solid MPP campaign. We've had a great campaign so far, which is awesome. And, the, okay, the RD campaign crashes and burns. What more could you ask for? Working well together. American society is disunited. So be it. It is what it is. There will be no compromises. Now, I want to be careful with this, just because we don't want things to go badly for us. So we're going to do one more focus over here, and then we'll come back down there. So... Fight for the future. Test the waters. Cures for a fat purse. His education reform will be abandoned if there's a crisis. Community action. Calling the community no child left behind. I don't like that idea. So, fight for the future. A day will come when all those who are gathered here today will leave this earth for the pearly gates of paradise. Well, supposedly. Our bodies may turn to ash and our names may scatter to the winds forgotten, but the actions that define our lives will leave an indelible indelible mark on the ground we tread and in the air we breathe. By such a time, our sons and daughters will inherit the world which we had shaped into our own image. Can we, in good conscience, leave them with ruins they can neither comprehend nor restore? 
This administration has endeavored to secure the future of our children through making changes to our community's economic, social, political structures. With affordable housing, your children will possess the greatest security civilization provides. With affordable health care, your children will possess a mighty bulwark against malaise and injury. And with affordable education, your children will possess the know-how not only to survive, but to prosper, to stand on their own two feet long after you're gone. Absolutely. And let's see what happens next. Alright, can we get another campaign going? We'll probably do it in the Great Lakes again. Because even Michigan's a toss-up. Indiana and Ohio. We're kind of leading, actually. That's not bad. Civilian construction spending? Great. Let's grab some of this. Max Factories is in a state. Absolutely no compromises. Humphrey grimaced watching the prison in front of the cameras. To put it mildly, he looked like crap. Stressed out by a mind from... Finangling the party's segregation as Harvey's Bobby had barely gotten a lick of sleep in the past three days. Even the best makeup artist in Washington couldn't hide it. Outwardly stoic, Humphrey wanted to bury his head in his hands. Every time the cameras cut back to Bobby, he got angry and hairier like a goddamn werewolf. Christ Almighty, he was sweating like Nixon. There will be absolutely no compromises on civil rights, exclaimed the president vigorously while also looking like he'd faint. He faint any second. My administration is 100% committed to equal rights for every American. The age of Jim Crow must end America's better. We're all better than this to hold the people in contempt for nothing more than this color of their skin. Oh, crud, thought Humphrey. He's going off script. Any American who denies his fellow for his rights, continued the president, is an, em is an enemy of the National Progressive Party and, above all, an enemy of America itself. Humphrey wanted to vomit right there in the White House press room. They were, things were rocky with Thurman and Wallace's gang, and this was going to make it a whole lot worse. He wondered if his phone was already ringing off the hook. Still, this sort of thing electrified the back blacks. Clenching his jaw, Humphrey prayed that America's newly in French African Americans would make themselves heard of the polling booths. Compromise is a Stalin between two fools. Hey, got more political power. Great. Uh, oh, and we're going to campaign next. And East Coast, we did the East Coast already. Well, we don't see too many RDs. Maybe the Southwest. NPP is a toss up down there. Well, I think let's, do, let's do the Southwest because we can. Why not? We might do well, we might not do well. You never know. If that's the case, I'm going to go ahead and spend a little bit more money, because now I want to get more political power, just in case, because this is going a little crazy. Catholic stance looking good. The Divine Mandate of Siberia is looking beautiful. It's still minus 21 billion, so that's not too bad. Men is doing a good job. Faith is a choice. And you have no choice to make. Uh, we're not passing any other bill right now, so let's zoom up. I'm, I, I kind of want to eat Southern Fears. We're definitely not going to campaign for civil rights. Yeah. Hmm. Actually, how's the political landscape? Is ready for anything still. So that's good. We haven't been killed yet. Please don't kill me, game. Please don't kill me. Please, please, please. Minus 21 billion. That's not, still not bad, so. Minus 20 billion in national debt. Nice. Oh boy, what's, going, what's happening? I was, I was lagging there a little bit. What, what's going on? Did someone win? Did someone win a war? No, they're still fighting down there. We have the Dofa Rebellion, but they still won. The people state of the Arabian Gulf. Well, Italy's over there. That's over there as, as well, too. You guys are still killing each other over here, which is fine. It's going to be really brutal and bloody, which is fine with me. I don't really care. What's next? Yeah, I mean, our party's still pretty unified, so that's pretty good for us. Ooh, building nuclear reactors. That's nice. Perhaps build in the Midwest. If we build in the Midwest, they might like us some more. So, Minnesota, Iowa. Good luck with that. Yeah, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, some for lines. So, I'm tempted to cut construction spending. Nice. A solid campaign. Great. Fight for the future. And output. Cap and output. Just, yeah, I gotta go with this one. So, the richest men in Babylon. On a hundred million TV screens, the face of RFK, the President of the U.S., flickered into being. He sat in the Oval Office, back to the presidential seal, looking into the lens with a sharp breath, he began. My fellow Americans, I come to you today to share with you my vision for America. On my travels across this great nation, the world's richest I've seen into the abyss of poverty that so many of our brothers and sisters are born into and die in a miasma of depression, for there is no escape even for the willing who are not provided the tools and resources to better their lives. It is a fallacy too often espoused by the callous and uncaring that people who are in poverty choose to be there or the rightfully deprived of the means of to the pursuit of happiness due to the color or class or faith. When any American denies to extend a helping hand to his fellow citizen, he denies America. Some are happy to turn their heads or to snatch crumbs out of the mouths of the hungry, but are not sent idly by while American children starve, while American women die in childbirth, while American workers are paid too little to support their families. We are better than that. We have the means to lift every American out of the depths of poverty, and I intend to make that beautiful dream a reality. In the coming years, my administration will dedicate itself to the creation of innovative new agencies and programs to provide much-needed welfare to impoverished Americans nationwide. 
We should not rest until every American has provided the means of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to those with three unalienable rights that have been denied to all too many. Thank you, and God bless the United States of America. Ms. Darkest Mansion, or the Darkened Mansion. A man watched over the President's address. As Kennedy finished, he, his wrinkled, liver-spotted hands lethargically reached for the receiver of the pristine white telephone sitting beside him. He dialed the long, familiar number and listened to the dial tone. When he finally connected, he said in a scratchy smoker's voice, We gotta do something about this guy. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Um... Well, then. Let's go to East Southern Fears. Uh, oh boy, that does not that does not sound good for me. Oh boy, oh no 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 no. But let's go ahead and do this, setting up the flames of hate. So it has been oft observed irony that the present laws of free speech have often protect those whose very nature assumes that the free speech is a sham. The unwavering blindness of Lady Justice lawmen argued dictate that all speech, no matter how hateful or spiteful towards the rights of others, must be placed under equal protection. Thus, one might find hate mongers standing atop their soapboxes and radio towers, questioning why their victims enjoy the very rights they were using to brown beat them into submission. This is the farce that has gone on for far too long. Either these malcontents stick to the spirit of free speech rather than abuse its words to the fullest extent, or they shall find themselves bereft of any speech at all, and we're going to end today's episode there. Hopefully, we don't die, and we can do and run a very successful uh, 1970 Senate election. But regardless, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, consider... Leave a like, you know. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you all in tomorrow's episode, 13B, as hopefully we can continue doing more and more reforms. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.